Unmuted. <laughs> How's everybody doing? I'm so glad everybody's in. It's just an awesome opportunity to um, kind of talk about stuff that I've been I've been talking about all my life. I, I, I it was interesting today uh, as I was going over a few things because I told um, Melissa I didn't want to make it too long, <laughs> but I, I I had to get some things straight and I was asking my mom all these questions and we were going back and forth trying to connect the dots of our family in Martinsburg, but. Um, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a blessing for me. I love, I love this, this, this little town of Martinsburg connects me to Poolsville. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't like Poolsville when I was growing up because I didn't grow up here, <laughs> but I ended up living here and I never thought I would. But once I learned the, 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 the real history of my family and the area that my family came from, um, which is a little town of Martinsburg, it just really, really sparked a, a lot of interest and a lot of um, pride, actually, for me. Um, and the family that I actually come from is called is, is the last. The surname is the Thompson family. And so I'll just give you a brief history of Martinsburg. And I called it the hidden gem of the Ag Reserve because you know a lot of people don't really. The town of Martinsburg is 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 dead now. Almost, you know, there, there are no really, you know, uh, any. Uh, it's not very many descendants left that were originally there, um, just a few. And, you know, it's different from Sugar Land and Jerusalem. There's still families living in those areas and in and, and different other areas in Jonesville, the, the, the African-American communities in the area. And so Martinsburg, the history has kind of gone a little bit by the wayside, even though it does have the Warren Historic Site upon it, which, which uh, in the middle of it, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But what I want to uh, talk about is a little bit start with the history of Martinsburg um, and the history really is, um, I can't get this thing to work. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Early history of Martinsburg. Martinsburg began as a crossroads village before the Civil War began with a store, a post office and a blacksmith shop. Um, and it says here, uh, uh, there was a settler of uh, uh, many of the early black settlers came to Martinsburg before the Civil War. And it was a black, it was a biracial township before the Civil War. We don't know exactly when, you know, folks started buying, you know, or, or uh, uh, having little plots of property. But um, Martinsburg actually was a, a crossroads city. It was a cross, little crossroads township as people were coming from Frederick and they were coming from Virginia and West Virginia across the ferry to do business and to visit and to travel. Martinsburg was, was a place where they stopped and, and could find a spot. They had their own little general store there. They had a, a black owned uh, um, blacksmith shop and the blacksmith shop was owned by a gentleman by the name of John Peters. I call him JP. Old J. Pete was the man. <laughs> Good looking guy, right? <laughs> J John Peters was one of the most influential landowners in the Ag Reserve, uh, as well as the owner of the blacksmith shop. And um, before John emerged, there was a gentleman by the name of um, Nathan Naylor. And Nathan Naylor bought 97 acres of property in 1866. So not very long after the war was over, you know, there were many slaves, obviously all of them were freed and many of them stayed where they were because they didn't have any means. But those who had skills like this man here, John Peters, who was a blacksmith, they were able to uh, save their money and, and, and go and buy, buy land. And, and land, you know, was, was as, as it is said here, only land for African-American and right after slavery was akin to freedom. It was the closest thing of being free, closest thing to, to, to having your freedom, your independence and your prosperity. It was, it was as if they were, they were tapping in to the American dream. And you know, this was the beginning of the town of, of Martinsburg. And we have, there were, there's, there, there were other founders. This, this man, John Peters was one of the founders and there are other founders uh, by the name of, the names were in the, in the 1867 census, Albert Green, Gilmore Green, James Rideout, this man, John Peters. And um, John Peters was the grandfather. John Peters actually was married to my great 
great aunt, <laughs> my great great grandfather's sister. So all of these families were really tied together. So when the, when 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 these guys decided to to move into this township, they bought parcels of land. And so it says the beginning point for the black community was on the summit of the hill northwest of the junction of Martinsburg Road and White's Ferry Road near Martinsburg Road near the present day cemetery of Warren United Methodist Church. 97 acres there had been purchased for $1,141 for, $1 for 100 acres. What a bargain by Nathan Naylor in 1866. And on a portion of this tract, a small church was built, which was up on a hill. It was up on a bluff. Um, it, it, as if, if you take, if you take uh, Elmer School Road all the way to the end, well, back in the day, that road went all the way across White's Ferry and up on a hill. And up on that bluff is where they built the church. And the church was a two-story church. Um, the original church was a two-story church up on that bluff. Um, they said the upstairs was used for parties and, and gatherings and community things, and the downstairs was used for services. Um, and so once they bought that property and built that church, that became the center piece of the community. And so before, it, before even a school was built, they were teaching their children inside of the little church that was built up on top of the hill there in Martinsburg, and it was built in 1876. And so when they built it, when, once they built that in 1876, you know, this home here that you guys see was is is my is my um, ancestral home. The, this part here, this man here, his name is Albert Thompson, and he was named as in in the night. I'll, I'll be. It says all of. All of the communities in the up county area, uh, out of all of them, Martinsburg is the most thoroughly identified in the 1879 Hopkins Atlas of Montgomery County. Whereas other black communities that are known to have been in existence at that time, such as Sugarland and Jerusalem were not indicated on a map. In Martinsburg, five houses of black families, this is in 1879, were identified by name. Those of Gilmore Green, John Peters, who was the man you guys just saw, Isaac Warren, and James Rideout, James Rideout, and Albert Thompson, who's this guy right here. That just happens to be my great great grandfather. So he was one of the original homesteaders. And if you look at this house right here, this portion of the house, this is the house my mom was born in. This is a house my grandfather and all his brothers and sisters were born in. This is a house that my that my, uh, <laughs> my, my, my great grandfather's brothers and sisters were born in, this house right here. And this portion, the smaller portion is one of the original log cabins. It was built by this man, by this man Albert Thompson, who was born in 1817. And it was said that these homes in the area at the time that were built by all of the men who bought these homes were built in this style. Now this style has, clap, has a um, weatherboard over top of it. This home here, this, this section of the home has weatherboard over top of it. But actually underneath the weatherboard are logs. It's a log cabin right here, two-story log cabin. I actually was in there myself as a young man. I walked in, walked upstairs and it was very sturdy. Over 150 years later, it was still good to go. It was, this building was torn down. This whole section was torn down um, when, when, when I purchased the property due to um, Pro, uh, problems with it having had been uh, set on fire by arsonists. Um, but this section here is the newer section. But if you look at this section here, this shows you, a, this is a very good example of what the houses looked like in that area when the settlers first started. This, this small portion of the house right here. This small portion is a great example of what the homes looked like in the 1870s. And we believe that Albert Thompson bought this property in 18, it, we thought it was 1867, but the, but the, the, the uh, papers say 1877. Then he put the property in, the, in, in, his oral, in his children's names. He put it in a few of his kids' names and they believe he did that to, to, to make sure that he didn't have any issues um, with anybody trying to take his property later on. So here we have the schoolhouse. This is the schoolhouse. This is still standing. This building was built in 1876. 
This is a schoolhouse and this lady that you see here is Florence Rebecca Johnson Hood, Martinsburg's first school teacher. She was from Washington, DC, and she married George Hood, whose mother was Susan, the daughter of Albert Thompson, the guy you just saw. <laughs> so her husband was Albert Thompson, my great granddaddy's grandson. And she was the very first school teacher in Martinsburg. And she, 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 you know, they 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 talked about school and how much of a, a challenge it was. You know, they were very, you know, they said school school began in September and ended mostly, ended usually in April. And, you know, this schoolhouse housed children from the first all the way up to the seventh grade. Most, most kids didn't go too far. Um, and it says, some of the recollections we have, it says the school began in September and lasted to April, but many students could not attend the complete session because they had to work. For example, a, 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 a um, resident who was my grandfather's um, second cousin, his name was Lemuel Graham. His father's name was Major Graham. And um, the gentleman that y'all just saw, John um, Peters was his grandfather. That was his mother's, grand, his mother's dad. Uh, Lemuel, Lemuel attended for only a few months a year. Um, if Link Hohen is listening, Lemuel Graham lived on Mr. Ray Hohen's property for many years because his property abutted right back up to Mr. Ray Hohen's property. A lot of that property was owned by Lemuel's dad, Major. Um, and Lem Lemuel worked, um, he said he worked usually on farms from spring to Christmas and received formal education only through the fourth grade. And many, of, many of the blacks were like that. And they said yet many, like many older blacks who did not complete their education, he learned to read and write. And this was a big deal for, for, for former slaves to learn to read and write because it was almost, it was illegal in most slaveholding states for slaves to learn to learn to read and write and and, and, and in a lot of areas it will it will cause you to get hung or even lynched if you went out of the way to go to learn and read and write so this lady had a daughter and this is her daughter and her daughter's name was Evelyn Hood Herbert and Evelyn Hood Herbert was born in this home. This is the home that that lady you just saw lived in. And this was her daughter. And she was the second teacher at that school. <laughs> and we have accounts from her telling us, talking about how life was for teachers back, back then. You know, it, it was very hard. It was very hard because they, were, they weren't afforded, the uh, African-Americans obviously weren't afforded the same, you know, um, type of education as, as the students of, of, as the white students were. And it was, it was very hard. It was very hard for them to, it was hard sledding for teachers to teach kids how to read and write, you know, from books that were outdated and in and, and, um, and very hard conditions. But, you know, they did the best that they could and they turned out very, very good students from, from what we understand. <laughs> people were, were uh, the people that came out of that, out of that little town were, were very educated. And it's, it's, and one of the recollections that Evelyn Herbert has, it says, it, it gives us a perspective on black education all over the county. As Evelyn Herbert recalls, reading, writing, and arithmetic were a must. Every morning and spelling was a must. You had, you, you also had geography and history in the first grade. It was mostly reading. You trained them to write, she said. Yes, most of them were beautiful writers. I'll say that. Most of them could read. I don't think any child that went out of this door couldn't read or write. And given the conditions under which she and other teachers had to work with these students, this was a remarkable achievement. Mr. Etheridge um, fleshed that out in his talk when he talked to us about all of these communities and the schools that were in these communities. It was said that the teacher received a, 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 a monthly salary of $57. And that was $57 less than a white teacher. So, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a challenge all the way around for these folks. Now, this is the house. Um, the, the Hood Herbert House, one of the homes that was, was recognized in the neighborhood. And this is the Hood Herbert House now. I'm not quite sure who lives there, <laughs> but this is the home and it's in good shape. It's still beautiful. That's what it would have looked like, you know, probably, I think it was, it was uh, white, but that's what it would have looked like with a metal roof. And I took this picture today. <laughs> so there are original, there are houses from the original homesteaders in Martinsburg that are still being used today. Not very many. Um, one of them burned down uh, um, a while back. 
couple years ago back up on Martinsburg Road. Now this is the Loving Charity Hall. And the Loving Charity Hall was built after the school and after the original church. The original church was built in um, 1876 and it was moved from the location up on the hill to where the church at, at the Warren Historic Site sits now. And it burned down a few years later, I think they said in the 1880s. And until the other church was built, they had service in this building right here. And this is what, this is the Love and Charity Hall. They think it was built around uh, 1914 by a gentleman by the name of Scott Beal, who was from Poolsville. Um, they paid him uh, a few dollars to build this. And these buildings were built all over the, all over the, they're very well known for their um, beautiful architecture, a special type of architecture. And also this was a two-story building. They had um, many community uh, um, um, events there. And they also rate, and all of the community events that were had there. My mom told me when they were kids, they used to watch movies in there. They used to have community events, dances and all that kind of stuff. And they would raise money for families. That's what the love and charity was. It was for, to raise money for families, for African-Americans in the state of Maryland who were not allowed to have life insurance. So they had to have a way to be able to put their families away when they died, or if they got sick and were unable, they could tap into the Love and Charity Fund. And that's what this building was for. This building um, was rebuilt though, and now it looks like this. And that's what it looked like when they first built it. So you can see, you know, these, these African-Americans that came off of these farms and built these homesteads even before the, the, the Civil War and after, when they made up their mind they were gonna have these towns, they were gonna do it big. <laughs> and in Martinsburg, they did it big. It was a biracial town. They had their own post office. They had their own blacksmith shop that was owned by African-American. You know, the, 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 the blacks and whites, I have been told by people who grew up there, black and white, always got along in Martinsburg. It was not the case in Poolsville. And I had a white man who, who grew up in Martinsburg tell me that we didn't, we didn't bother too much with them folks down in Poolsville because we got along with, he said, we got along with the coloreds in Martinsburg and they got along with us. And that made me feel really good. And it gave me a, um, a perspective on, you know, how uh, um, this guy, Albert Thompson survived when he bought this homestead and, and, and built this home because his wife was Caucasian. Her name was Eliza, my great, great grandma. And guess what? They didn't hang Albert, thank God. <laughs> he was able to, to live peaceably in the, in the town. And, and uh, you know, he did, he did, he did all right. <laughs> he did all right. He was able to keep us going as a family. And, you know, the Love and Charity Hall has been rebuilt. They rebuilt it last year. Um, the inside is still not done. They, they received a grant. And this site in, um, in Martinsburg is the only site in the state of Maryland um, that was built by former slaves or established by former slaves that still has all three of the original buildings on it. Um, the original town, the original buildings um, that centered in the town, the church, the schoolhouse, and the um, building. Now, I got some, some, some pictures here that um, I kind of added in because I wanted to <clears throat> add a little bit of the, uh, of the personal history. And now I will talk about the community institutions. Martinsburg is the only rural black community in Maryland, like I said, to have known to have, still have all three institutions standing. The church, the school and the benefit society lodge, it still stands. And the church is na was, was named Warren United Methodist Church named after Isaac Warren, a member of its first, its first board of directors um, and trustees. Um, the, it, and the handsome frame church with its Gothic motifs constructed in 1903 is still in use and shares its, it, it, and well, it's not still in use, but it was at the time this was written. Um, and so it's very, very important to look at some of these um, uh, 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 homes. I wanna go back to this homestead because um, there's they, they, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the ledger, it talks about this road and, and this home, and it talks about it on the, on the, being on the North side of White's Ferry Road and all of the different things. But um, this style of log cabin is, is pretty rare. 
you know, to have seen. You know, most log cabins were one story. And they didn't have windows all the way around like that. So, you know, it, it allows us to see that many of these people, um, they had very um, strong um, um, skills in building. And, the, and the, 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 um, the description of this building states that this log house is, is it, it, at the time it was the only one still standing. Um, it says this house is also one of the comparatively few log houses that had survived at that time. Um, this house um, was heated by a wood stove. It was, it, 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 this type is markedly larger than the ones frequently um, built and described in Southern Maryland because it has a two room plan rather, rather than one room. It was heated by a wood stove instead of an open fireplace and the interior was illuminated and ventilated by sash windows with glass panes instead of wooden shutters. Features like these show how this house was in advance of the type of building black sharecropping family was an advance of the building that block sharecropping families were doing in Southern Maryland. Um, this house was similar to the John Peters house, which was one of the first homes that were built in Martinsburg. So it was very important, you know, to our family to keep this house. But when I bought the property that I live on now, which is, you know, where this house is housed, uh, uh, or was was standing um, before the house of uh, my house uh, the property could go into my um, possession they had to tear this home down because it had been condemned because somebody had come along one night in the early 90s and tried to set it on fire did set it on fire and so the house had been condemned and they were trying to make us buy an easement and all this other pay for an easement and a bunch of other things so we didn't do we didn't do that because it was just gonna be way too expensive. And uh, it broke my heart, but my uncle had to advise us to tear the home down, which, you know, I, I really didn't wanna have to do, but it's just, you know, how things go sometimes. This right here is Mary Ellen Beckwith Thompson. This is my great grandma. This is my granddaddy's mama. And um, um, this is, I, I have a better picture of this guy. But this is my granddaddy's daddy, Otho Merle Thompson. He, he was born in 1862. And um, his mom was uh, Caucasian. His mom was Eliza. This guy right here had a sister who went to Chicago and passed for white. <laughs> yeah, I got white family in Chicago I don't know anything about. She would write letters to her mother, uh, we were told, and stay in contact with her mom. We don't know if her, if her husband knew that you know she was African American or not. Um, I'm assuming that he did. We don't know, but she assimilated into white society. I had my mother has a picture of her, so I don't have that tonight. But um, uh, when if I get a chance to do the history of my family, we can do that <laughs> another time. But um, these are just you know I wanted to kind of give some some faces to what these folks look like. This was another closer picture of my great granddaddy. Um, Otho, and this is his son, my grandfather's brother, James, who lived in that house, was born in that house. He lived there until he passed. He lived with my grandparents after they bought the home. This is my granddaddy's brother, Richard Henry Carroll Thompson, born in 1890. We called him Uncle Carroll. He was the guy that was responsible for my grandfather not going into um, the Negro Leagues. <laughs> because he promised my grandfather that he was gonna give him money to go to Pittsburgh because they wanted him to play shortstop for the Homestead Grays uh, Negro League uh, farm team. And Uncle Carol took the money and went to California and never came back. <laughs> so, and this is his sister, my grandfather's sister, Mary Ellen, Molly Thompson. These are real people, guys. I want y'all to see these people that came out of this little community up here, okay? You know, this is just, these are just the pictures that came out of my family album. You know, um, and these are just some of them. That was my Aunt Molly. Aunt Molly had a home in Georgetown. She had a house in Georgetown. She left. All of these people got the hell out of Martinsburg as soon as they could <laughs> because life was too much like slavery for them. You know, it wasn't much going on. And if you, if I will, let me go back. If you take a look at my great grandfather here, 
He's standing by, uh, uh, and all, he's, he, he worked for the state road. Big, big time job for a black man back in those days. And this is close to the turn of the century here. And if you see what he's standing beside, that's an old, old, old bulldozer. See, the wheel is taller than he is. <laughs> and he, that, that's not saying much because he was pretty short, runs in the family. However, this African-American was allowed to run that machine. He was taught to run that machine because he was, they knew that he was biracial. So they gave him a chance to work a machine. If they didn't know that this guy was biracial, he would have never got a chance to learn how to sit up on a machine like that. And you see this guy beside him, that was my Uncle Jimmy, that was his son. He taught my Uncle Jimmy how to run the machine. And when Uncle Jimmy got a job with the state road, they put him on my great grandfather's crew and my great grandfather showed him how to run that machine. Okay. And, 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 and I say all that to say, you know, life was hard for these guys. It was hard enough to just get a job, but then to be um, labeled before you could even get a chance to try to show somebody that you could do to learn how to do a job. It was very, very difficult. And so, you know, it, 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 it's just a, 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 a picture of how, how, how really hard it is to, um, to, to continue to, um, you know, do what you need to do for the people that have done what they needed to do back in those times, it was just so very hard um, for them. Okay. All right, and that's my grandfather's other sister. Wait a minute, that's on too. Let me go back. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm having some uh, few connection issues here, but I'm working on it. Um, okay. Let me go back. Okay, that's Ada Myrtle Thompson and Manuel Moses Thompson. That was my grandfather's other sister, another sister of his. And brother. And um, they, um, my grandfather had many, many, uh, a few brothers that were in, in the war. They were in the war, and in the Great War, the World War. And so, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, we, we found that we would just find these, <laughs> these, these pictures all over the place in the house of people in uniform. We didn't know who they were. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we started asking questions and trying to figure things out. But um, thankfully, things continue to move forward and you know um we were able to, to to identify who a lot of these people were my mom some of the older older pictures my mother didn't know because people back in those days they just didn't talk very much about you know what was going on um as far as who the family members were and everything so we really had to you know they didn't label the pics and you had to find them and all that stuff so it was very important to our family to continue to keep these things going you know our, our family going in the right direction so that you know we could continue to keep these things, you know, in the family. Um, as you can see, my aunt Sue right there. Aunt Sue was my grandfather's sister. She lived with them until her death. Um, she died actually. She was born on that property and she died on that property. And so it was. It was. Uh, it, it was a blessing. My my aunt Sue right there. She 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 gave me my love for M and M's. <laughs> she always had she always had a tin of M&Ms on her dresser <laughs> and me and my cousin Jay always knew we could run in there and get M&Ms without grandma knowing. So this this is a, a, a big time, a big time memory. She was a beautiful lady and she never got married. And I asked my grandma, how come Aunt Sue never got married? She actually left um, this area and moved up to Pittsburgh for many years. And then she moved back when her mom got ill. And she never moved away after that. She just stayed living with my grandparents. And so it was very, it was a big deal, you know, for our family to, to um, you know, keep things connected and know that, you know, they, they took care of each other, you know? And so this was called the home place. That's what they called it. You know, that, that, that was the place that, you know, that was like the gathering place for the family in Martinsburg, you know, when they would all come back home. The only ones that really stayed up here you know, for the duration was my granddaddy and, and my aunt Sue, the picture that you just saw of her. And she, she you know, she was really, um, 
influential in, in, in making sure that my cousins and I knew who our other cousins were. I remember when I came up to visit my grandparents with a, a ex-girlfriend of mine and my aunt Sue, this lady right here, proceeded to tell me that we couldn't date because we were related. <laughs> like six times removed. And I'm like, Aunt Sue, it's a little too late for that now. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, we, we didn't go too far with that. But, you know, family is, is amazing to me. I'm very proud of the rich history up here in Martinsburg. You know, we have, you know, so many people who have gone and, and left the area. And, you know, they, 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 um, they, they, they have a, uh, every year, they have a uh, historic homecoming and uh, at the church and uh, many of the ancestors, you know, that are still living, the descendants, of, uh, the descendants that are still living, uh, come back and um, they have church service all day and they eat the old ham sandwiches like they used to do when we would have homecoming. And, you know, just um, um, really, really enjoy the time you know, that we have and, and just kind of bring back the memories. You know, it's, it's, it's so very hard, you know, when, you know, the, the whole, uh, many of the people moved out of the area and the community kind of just died. It, it sort of died off. And so once the church shut down, that was kind of the end of the community. Um, and the church itself actually was built by the same man who built the church in Sugarland. His name was Scott Beal. And they said when Scott built the church, he gave them 10 bucks. They paid him 60 bucks to build it, and he gave them $10. We'll just give it a second, everybody. I think that. He is frozen. I'm back. <laughs> I'm sorry. So actually go. at this time, I can, open, I can open it up. You know, you guys can open it up for any questions. I was, what I was gonna say is the church was built by a guy by the name of Scott Beal. Um, from from Poolsville, and he was very influential in building the church, which is down in um, in Quince Orchard, and also a historic church, uh, the historic church in 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 Sugarland, built by the same builder. And so, um, if there's any questions, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest um, going around about history nowadays, and and I really feel like you know there's a the, you know really I I I can do a much more exhaustive history. Of what happened to his aunt Molly? Okay. Hello. All right. Can can we go ahead and open for questions? I don't want to keep freezing up while I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I... start taking questions from the chat first, and oh. then. And then we can open up for general questions if sure. that's okay. Sure. Um, our first question from the chat is what year did the school first open, the first school open? The school opened in uh, uh, 1876. What kind of work did your aunt Sue do in Pittsburgh? Was there more employment opportunities there? I'm sorry, I keep freezing up. It's okay, take your time. I'm good. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did y'all get the first one? Yeah, we got the first school, um, but we didn't get your answer to the question about your Aunt Sue. What, what was the question? What kind of work did your Aunt Sue do in Pittsburgh and was there more employment opportunities there? Yeah, she worked, as far as I know, she, she was a domestic, but when she first went up there, but they had a lot of factory work up there. And she had an older brother, um, my uncle Wesley, he was the oldest brother of them. And he went to Pittsburgh and he worked in, he worked in the mills, the steel mills up there. It was big, big time work up there. Why is the church no longer used? 
Um, that's a good question. I mean, Hosanna, my church was in there. Hosanna was in there for a couple of years and it just didn't really fit our needs. You know, that church was built in 1903. It doesn't have a bathroom. You got to go next door to the schoolhouse, to the bathrooms that were added on in the 1940s, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to have church in that building. You know, we did it for a few years, but it's tough, you know, it's, uh, but I, I would love, you know, to maybe have a service there maybe once a month or something like that once, you know, things open back up. But, you know, uh, being a United Methodist Church, once the United Methodist Churches don't have enough people, um, they basically close them and merge them with other churches. And that's what happened to that church. And so it sat empty for a long time. And um, many of the descendants decided in the, in the 90s to um, start raising money to buy that property back from the United Methodist Church. And that's what they did. And that's, and today the church, the schoolhouse and the Love and Charity Hall are all comprised of Warren um, Historic Site. The next question is, was there a local league that your uncle played in? Uh, that was my grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather, he did play in a local league. There were local leagues. They played, a lot of local teams played. Actually, there was a baseball field in Martinsburg, I hear. <laughs> yeah, they had a baseball field up there. I'd ha We'd have to do a walking tour for me to show you guys where it is. Cause I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you where it was. You know, I, I, I think I know where it was, but, you know, I, I wasn't there. So, you know, but there's a lot of people. Um, yeah, my, my, it was a lot of baseball being played around here. I know there was a field called the Joe Davis field, which is in Boyd's where, you know, all the huge games for the African-Americans were played. They had a lot of dances and stuff out there, you know, um, and, and uh, but that was my grandfather's passion. Is the school now a private home and will the Loving Hall House and Museum be open for events, et cetera? Repeat that question. Is the school now a private home and will the Loving Hall House a Museum be open for events and et cetera? Uh, no, the school is not a private hall. And I do believe they probably will open that building for events, but it's not done on the inside yet. They, they haven't finished um, redoing the inside. So they're still, you know, um, waiting for the grant money to finish the inside. And I mean, with COVID going on, it's really kind of a, a tough deal, but we would love to use that place once it gets open, you know, for community uh, meetings and things of that nature. It's a beautiful building and it, it, it's, a, it's a miracle that it even survived because it's been looking like it was going to fall down for 25, 30 years, maybe more. Our next question is, do you have any family stories about why Martinsburg community is so different in attitude from Poolsville? Um, no, I really couldn't tell you. I think it could, I think part of the pro, part of the reason was of uh, the proximity of the people to each other. And I think many of these people were on these farms around here anyway. These homesteaders came from, many of them came from the farms that were right here and they were slaves on these farms. And so, you know, I guess the people up here just had a different way of dealing with things. You know, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the difference was. Um, and my grandparents, they never really talked about it. You know, it was never really anything that was talked about. Can you tell us about the original church that was moved? Yes, that church was a two-story church um, built in 1876. And it, 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 um, they said they decided they wanted to move it off the hill. And so what they did was they got some sort of, they built some sort of contraption and they actually lifted the church off of its foundation and put it on these logs and rolled it with oxen, pulled it with oxen and put it where it is now or where the new church, where the, where the church that was built in 1903 is now. But it burned down, they said. And so um, in the interim, they had church in the schoolhouse and in the Love and Charity Hall until the, the new building was built. Do you know when the schoolhouse was discontinued? 1939. 1939 was, when, was the last uh, classes that were, were in there. 
And that was the year my mom, incidentally, the year my mom was born. <laughs> so she didn't never, she never attended that school. But my grandfather did. And all of his brothers and sisters did. Are there any historic maps? Um, there are a few historic maps. Yeah, we I don't have any access to them. I do have I did um, have a few um, that I didn't I wasn't able to get up on here. But there are definitely historic maps that, like I said, like I was mentioning that show um, some of the original landowners, one of which was my great grandfather, Albert, um, Albert Thompson. He uh, he was uh, this guy right here. <laughs> he uh, he was one of the original guys there, but um, you know, and and they said you know there were many many people that possibly already lived here, but they were only you know, they only could identify four, five landowners in the 1879 census, or or I'm um, sorry, property land survey. Of your family members who served in World War One, what jobs were they assigned? You know, I don't know that. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you that. I, I actually, the picture of my uncle Manny there, he lived in Rockville. He, he um, was probably my granddaddy's closest brother to him. Um, but I, I don't, I really don't know. We didn't even, like I said, we didn't know that uncle Manny was even in the army until we started looking through pictures. You know, I, I had another picture on there of his brother, Carol, who was in, in, in the army as well. So, I mean, you know, many, the, the, the army at that time, it, that was, that was in World War One, you know, early 1900s. It obviously was segregated. So, you know, they didn't give them very, <laughs> you know, uh, jobs. They didn't give them jobs they thought they could handle, put it that way. They gave them jobs they thought they could handle, you know, cleaning up and, you know, just support jobs. Do you know the origin of the name Martinsburg? No. All we know is that was the name of the road. <laughs> Nobody could find it. And every time you talk about Martinsburg, they think you talk about West Virginia. <laughs> so it, it'll come out somewhere. I don't know. I know there was a guy by the name of Martin Thompson that owned a lot of property and slaves. And it wasn't too far from here. There's a place called Thompson's Corner up there on the other side of Barnesville, which is uh, the corner of Comus and I believe Peachtree Road. So you know, it's a huge, if you go to Thompson's Corner and look down that, stand on that corner and look down that hill, if you're African-American and your mama's maiden name is Thompson, you can see your family standing down in that field 150 years ago, you know? So, you know, these names came from somewhere. There's a lot of names up here. You know, that's why I was talking to people about the names on these streets up here. A lot of the names on the streets are from Confederates. The African-Americans up here don't want to see that, to be quite frank. And we've been up here long enough. The families have been in this area long enough for us to have our names on some of the stuff up here. I want to see a Warren Street and a Thompson Street and a Rideout Street and a Peters Street. As a matter of fact, the White House that sits right next to the um, Episcopal Church was owned by um, that guy's son, who was a doctor trained at Howard University. <laughs> And, you know, he was, he was kind of hoity-toity. And my grandfather said, now this guy's, this guy's son was a doctor. He was my grandfather's second cousin and he wouldn't come from Poolsville down to Martinsburg to, to, to visit with his family because he thought he was too good for them, you know? And so this stuff, it, it goes, you know, the, the, there's a lot of, you know, our family, you could see this man, this was in the 1860s, when the 70s, when this picture was taken. This guy was a man of means. You know, John Peters had money. <laughs> he was good looking and he wanted to get what he wanted. <laughs> you know, and, 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 he, and he had to have been a very good businessman. Um, and, and um, you know, so I, I really don't know what, what, the, what the difference was you know, between Poolsville and Martinsburg. I, I, I really don't know why there was such a big difference. Our next question is kind of similar, but it's, do you know the origin of the name Loving? Oh, the Loving, the Loving Charity, the Loving Charity, it, it was a group called the, Love, the, the, um, the, the Order of, the, of Love and Charity. <laughs> the Benevolent Order of Love and Charity. 
and they would build these these buildings all over you know um the country in different african-american communities to help them you know they, they they would commission these buildings to be built so that they these african-american communities could have money raised for their families you know uh and the families that were in their neighborhood you know or in their communities that didn't have money for people who were sick and couldn't work or folks that needed to, you know, didn't have, they didn't, none, you know, we weren't allowed to have life insurance. We, we couldn't have life insurance. I guess our lives didn't <laughs> warrant having life insurance. I don't know. I don't know, but either way, you know, we had the same needs. So we had to find a way to get those needs met. And that thank, thankfully, you know, places, people, you know, things, you know, entities like that were, were around. Is there a Martinsburg Cemetery? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And it's if you go, if you go down White's, if you go down White's Ferry Road and make a right on Martinsburg, and you go down straight down Martinsburg Road and you get to that real first sharp turn where Kaleva is, instead of making a turn, just go straight. And when you turn down in there, don't go where Kaleva is, just take the take the road that goes to the left. And just bear to the left, and you go on up that road and up that hill. It's a it's a dirt road now. It's a, it's a dirt road that goes up the hill. Um, and when you go up that hill, you can see you, you can almost see where the church would have been, you know. And um, there's many um, people laying uh, in that in that cemetery up there, and there's many uh, uh, many parts of the cemetery which are overgrown. And um, my church, the men in my church and the men in, uh, at Memorial are going to get together on the 22nd of November. And we're going to go up there and start trying to clear some of the parts of the cemetery that have been grown over um, as, a, as sort of a kind of reconciliation project. <coughs> That's really neat. That, that reminds me to a similar presentation we had recently with Glenn Wallace. I don't know if you know him, but he is no. a, a cemetery historian locally, and he works on um, local cemetery restorations, like Monocacy talk Cemetery. To him. <laughs> yeah, you you definitely should. I think he'd be really, really interested in that project. All right, Dottie. Make Wallace. it happen, Dottie. <laughs> I, I shall. I shall. I'll pass you on his email, but okay. um, he does a lot of work like that, and I think he'd find that really interesting and be able to help. Yeah. Um, our next question is what was the peak population of martinsburg in its heyday oh the peak population they said there were about at the at its peak about 40 to 50 homesteads and they were all they were all up and down martinsburg road um they were up and down trundle road my my mom's cousin uh, my grandfather's cousin um alonzo graham he owned uh 20 acres over there on, on trundle road um, they were on Elmer School Road, and, and there were homesteads on Club Hollow Road as well. And if you if you go if you go back and if you if you walk back in the woods on on Trundle Road, you will see in this in this in the fall. Cause I know because I used to hunt that property. You will see in the fall in in the fall in the winter. You'll see the outlines of where the homes were back in that area. You can see the foundations. You can see some of the wells that are dug. And I remember. My granddad's cousin, cousin Alonzo, when we would go hunting, he would say, all right, boys, y'all be careful. Don't step in any of those wells. Because at this point, they're all filled up with, with uh, the wells are filled up with leaves. So if you don't know where you're going, you can step right into one of them. But yeah, it, 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 it was quite an extensive community. It ran up and down. Um, um, it, it pretty, the Black folks pretty much started at Trundle. And they 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 uh, they had homesteads on Trundle, on White's Ferry, on Martinsburg, on Club Hollow Road, and on Elmer School. So it was like almost 50 houses. Can you speak to the houses that were built across the road from the church? I have heard that there were many. I think that's similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you answered yeah. that in your last one. Was there a dry goods okay. store, or did they have to travel to Poolsville for supplies? 
Uh, some supplies they had to get, but most of the, for the most part, they could get their dry goods right there in Martinsburg. They didn't, they didn't really, you know, they dealt with Poolsville. It wasn't like they had some kind of, I mean, all these little communities kind of had rivalries anyway. I remember hearing my, hearing some of my grandfather's cousins talk about, you know, that Martinsburg was known later on for being kind of rough. You know, if you didn't know anybody, you didn't, anybody in Martinsburg, you didn't go there. <laughs> You know, it was a juke joint up there in the, in the, in the 20s, 30s and 40s, you know, people kind of hung out, you know, and if you didn't know anybody in Martinsburg and you want, you know, it was a tough spot, <laughs> put it that way. But yeah, those houses were up and down the road. They were, you know, they had a great, uh, um, a, a, a great camaraderie. I mean, those people in Martinsburg really have a great love for each other and they still do. When they come together, you could just see it, you know. Um, Actually, the first funeral that I ever went to, I was up here with my grandma and she took me to one for some guy named Mr. Coleman. <laughs> when I was like five years old and she made me sit in the back of the church and I was like, Grandma, is he really dead? <laughs> she said, yeah, baby. <laughs> Coleman was another one of the names, you know, landowning names from up there, the Dorseys, the Colemans, the Rideouts, the Thompsons, the, the Fairfaxes, you know, a lot of family names, the Bells. So many. I think the last question I've received in the chat is, did Blacks and Whites attend the school? No, they did not. The Whites had their own school. So after that, does anyone else want to unmute and turn your camera on to ask you questions directly? And if not, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. It was so fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. That was